And uh, it turns out that when you're doing spell check, it would really help if you check all the files. So sorry about the introducing thing. Oh, well. Okay, so we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. One of the, one of the most important things that, that we wanted to, to highlight is uh, a new way that we are keeping track of connection state as we're talking to remote systems. So that's what the Scatter Connect is all about. And you'll, you'll see that in detail. In fact, that's the first thing that we're going to hit off. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the tool that we're releasing today. Uh, it's, we actually have released it uh, previously, but this new, uh, this new version has somewhere around uh, 25,000 lines of code change. So it's, it's definitely different. And then we're going to demonstrate uh, some of what, what uh, it can do. So I'm Robert Lee. I uh, do stuff with a couple companies. Um, and this is Jack, and we also have uh, Anthony here in the audience. We've been working really hard on this stuff, so hopefully you'll, you'll be able to appreciate some of what we've been working on. Okay, so nice and simple. You've all seen a, a TCP three-way handshake before. The concept is simple. You're, you're trying to initiate a, a connection. You send a send packet. You expect a send act if it's open. You acknowledge it, and then your, your, uh, your connection is open. It's actually you know, two one-way connections, but whatever. I'm not sure if you can see this, but I'll, I'll, I'll visually walk you through what's happening here. Uh, the very first process, uh, the master control on the far left is what's going to keep track of all the state connections. Uh, in this particular example, we are doing a TCP port 80 uh, full connection with a remote host. That's the one on the far right with the little globe thing. Uh, what happens is the master control uh, tells the first sender, the one on the very top, that we are trying to connect to that, that remote network. And then the sender will actually create a, a, a packet uh, spoofing its source IP address to come from the receiver. Uh, if you can see it, it's the, the, the receiver machine is the one on the far bottom. When the, uh, the remote host, the 192.168.1.1, receives that send packet, it responds to the send packet based on the IP address that it thought it came from. So that's how the receiver receives it. Once the receiver receives the SYNAC, it sends the meta information back to the master control thread, who then schedules uh, an acknowledgment to be sent through uh, an immediate sender. So that's the one in the middle. So the acknowledgment is then sent back to 192.168.1.1, and the three-way handshake is complete. Now, I know this looks pretty crazy, and you're probably asking yourself right now, why would you do it this way? And I'm glad you asked that question. We'll, we'll answer that later. But the important part here is that you understand that at this point, we have taken the TCP IP stack and moved it out of uh, kernel space and essentially into user land space. And we've made it so that you can, you can have a, a three-way handshake amongst a cluster of machines. But to the, uh, to the end machine on, on the right-hand side, uh, it, it's all you know, a normal connection to him. Um, once his handshake is complete, we can also then send uh, you know, arbitrary uh, payload specific stuff. So if you wanted to do a GET request or um, any, any arbitrary payload can be sent at that point. Important, important stuff. Okay, so I, I just explained all this, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through it one more time just, uh, just for clarity. Uh, you know, the first process again uh, is the unicorn scan main thread. Uh, second process is the sender, that's unison. That's the one that actually assembles the packets. Um, and again, we have, we have the concept of batch sender and immediate sender. The batch sender, it turns out, uh, is the one that you give large work units to. So you can say, I want to scan this slash 16 network, and I'm looking to, to do these ports. And you tell it what speed to do it, and et cetera, et cetera. So it just goes out and sends a bazillion send packets. Uh, the, the listener process, the one on the bottom, you know, listen, is the one that's collecting all the information that comes back to it and sending um, you know, all the metadata back to the main unicorn scan thread. Um, and then you know, the immediate mode is the one that completes the three-way handshake. They're, uh, they're not actually threads, by the way. They're actually processes. We just call them threads. Because we're silly like that. OK, cool. I've talked about all this. Um, is that part clear at all? All right, cool. We did it twice. Now I'm going to talk about um, some problems that we were banging our heads against. Uh, by the way, all we do uh, with the companies is we do a lot of security testing, really big networks. And um, you know, we were, we've been eating a lot of dirt with uh, you know, tools that didn't do what we needed to do. So that's basically why we did this. But one of the first problems that we ran into 
is uh, the whole UDP thing. You know, just to summarize, uh, when you're doing UDP scanning, traditionally you're sending uh, a UDP probe with a blank datagram, and you're hoping that the, the machine on the other side will send you an ICMP packet. So if, uh, if the port's closed, you'll, you'll, you'll know. And, and you basically, the ones that you don't get the message back from, you assume that it's open. The problem is, it turns out people are actually using firewalls. And so when you're, when you're doing uh, testing from a remote perspective, if you can't count on the ICMP message coming back to you, then it's kind of a useless process. That's one of the problems. The other problem is uh, you can't go really fast, even with the machine sitting next to you and there's no filtering going on because ICMP messages are rate limited. So it's a really slow and, and ugly process. Um, so what we ended up doing as is, is you know, a quick and dirty uh, workaround is we were taking the, the individual programs like BIG or SNMP Walk and uh, we, were, we were scripting it to you know, send the actual client probes. And then we got this idea, you know, maybe it would be cool if we, if we had an automated way of, of doing all, all of those probes uh, without having to, to manage, uh, you know, the individual tools and all the individual output. But we'll come back to that. Uh, another problem we had with our TCP scanning uh, is that it, it, was a, it was a large uh, effort to do what we really wanted to do, which is uh, actually talk to the service, the, the service that we wanted to interact with. So, you know, typically if you're scanning like a slash eight, uh, you have to, you know, just, just based on, on uh, the resource limitations on your side alone, usually you'll, you'll have to do a SIN scan first and keep track of which ports are open. And then uh, the, on the open ports, you can go back and actually do a banner grab. And then, you know, as a third step, you can, you can start interacting with the remote service. You can use, you know, AMAP or manual testing or whatever. Uh, but that's, it's difficult, especially if you're testing a dynamic network that's really large, because by the time you're done with your first pass, things have changed. Because uh, it turns out that uh, these networks are getting really big, uh, especially now that we're, we're starting to move into IPv6 stuff. But the, the tools that we're using today are not really useful if you're testing 65,000 to 4 billion machines at a time. Uh, and even if you were, uh, playing with set and knock with the text output is really overwhelming really overwhelming. Okay, some more problems that we have with, uh, with you know, any vulnerability scanner that, that we've played with is that they, uh, they, they take their, uh, the probes that they do don't really share the information in a way that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, one of our favorite examples to make fun of is uh, the situation where some sort of device in the middle is, is altering the TCP IP stack enough to where uh, your, your operating system probe comes back and says, hey, it's an Amiga Miami OS machine. Who the hell runs Amiga Miami OS? But anyhow, uh, then the second probe that actually connects to TCP port 80 and does a banner grab will show you that it's an IIS 5 machine. And then uh, because they have an IPS or something actively killing uh, connections when it sees, you know, something bad across the wire, when you send your, your Apache exploit, it kills the session and, and you know, your, your tool thinks that the, uh, the DOS attack was successful. So then you come back and find out that, you know, Apache uh, DOS vulnerability was, was successful. So, you know, that's fine. If you're testing one machine, you can go through the false positives and figure out what's really going on. But imagine doing this times four billion machines. Not really useful. Uh, so to, to be useful in the future, these modules are going to need to share the information more intelligently. Um, some more problems that we're having is with, with the timing. Um, in, in order to, to more efficiently use the resources that, that you have available to you, uh, we need to be able to control uh, how fast we're sending. And, I'm, and you know, I'll give you the, the two examples in the open source space. We, we have you know, the ScanRAN tool that provided a minus B option for bandwidth. But, uh, you know, I, I probably just haven't played with it enough, but in, in my experience, uh, anything over like 5K to 10K, I was noticing a lot of uh, packet loss, and, and it also became bursty. Um, and so it didn't really work out. Uh, mostly because of, of the way that uh, the, the sleep timer was working and the get time of day uh, counter was working. And then with Nmap, you have uh, normal, aggressive, insane, or things like that. But even in insane mode, uh, it doesn't scale to high speeds. And uh, it, it, there's a lot of parallelization going on there that, that's uh, uh, kind of tricking you into thinking that it's doing more than it is. But uh, the, the timing of how fast you can go is still greatly affected by the machines that you're probing. To scan Rand's, uh, or Nmap's credit, rather, uh, we actually got Nmap to send out more packets per second than we did scan Rand. Oh, oh, just some raw numbers real quick. Um, 
with our with our tool at this point on a, on a standard copper gigabit card, uh, we're we're successful at sending over 160,000 packets per second reliably, and we're working with some FPGA people to get that uh, in the 500,000 to million uh, a packet per second range. Uh, but we're still working on that. That's that's pie in the sky at this point. But uh, from an average laptop, you can expect anywhere from 17,000 to 70,000 packets per second being pretty reliable to send. But you, you're still going to you're still going to want to break it up into into different processes, and I'll show you why. Um, some more mindset. Okay, so now we've told you about some problems. What are we going to do to solve these problems? Well, from from the from the get go, we we were designing this with scalability in mind. Uh, I, I talked about efficient use of resources, and I'm going to give you a bus analogy. Uh, basically, I watched Sesame Street as a kid, and uh, they, they were trying to uh, pollute our minds with this political message that buses are better than Ferraris because they're more efficient. Um, but the, in the example, they had 100 kids on the left and 100 kids on the right, and they had like three uh, small sports cars busing or you know, ferreting people from one site to another site. They gave them like a 20-minute head start. And then they had the other 100 kids all jump on one bus and just go. Um, let me break it down technically now. Um, when you use an individual machine, there's only so fast that you can reliably send and receive packets. So even if you could get NMAP or ScanRen to go at 70,000 packets per second, you're not going to have any room left to receive messages. And so you're, you're going to have to throw that back to you know, something more reasonable, around the 35,000, 30,000 packet per second range, if you, if you actually want to get uh, the, the messages to come back to you. Uh, so that's, that's not going to be an efficient use of even a single machine. But uh, you know, with, with scalability in mind, we know that we, we, we need to be able to have a one logical working uh, scanning system that can scale beyond the, the, the limitations of any single resource, any single machine. So it's not, it's not the same as just going faster. I quoted some really ridiculous packet per second rates from a single machine, but obviously if you go that fast to any uh, remote network that we're playing with today, you're going to obliterate it. I mean, I've, I've seen some of these networks with like even, even the big, you know, high-end Juniper uh, firewalls um, sitting in front of multiple OC3s that fall over dead at even at 8,000 packets per second if they have that, that stupid SIN scan protection thing on. By the way, funny. If any uh, if any Juniper people are listening, I don't I don't get that protection that that completely doses your CPU is well I don't understand that at all. Anyhow, moving on. Okay, accuracy. If if you're collecting a lot of information and it's a lot of uh, invalid information, then you're wasting your time. This is this is my problem with those log aggregation systems where you have the garbage in garbage out model. If you can't trust the information, it's kind of worthless. One of the problems that we have with a lot of tools is they, they try to be smarter than uh, is programmatically possible. Um, basically, I think tools should introduce stimulus and record response and let the humans analyze. Computers are good at doing the tedious automated parts. Humans are good at thinking, and we shouldn't really mix the two more than we have to. Uh, flexibility. Uh, it, at this point, with this framework, and you, you'll see examples of this, uh, any stimulus that you want to introduce to the remote side, currently we support uh, uh, TCP and UDP, but we're going to support ICMP and uh, pretty much anything else that you can do over IP. And then, you know, depending on which contracts happen, we, we're also going to support uh, a lot of other protocols. But if, if you need, if you have the hardware and you need to, to write something to the hardware, we're going to be able to support it in the future. Uh, and then security. Uh, it should go without saying, but it, it doesn't really. Uh, we, we, we tried to put some formal thought into this, and, and we, uh, we actually selected uh, one of the IDS protection profiles from the common criteria to, uh, to, to build our implementation of, of the, the scanner against. And uh, we also provide a, a sample security policy for use with uh, SE Linux. And yeah, <clears throat> that was at least uh, in the design phase when we considered that. So we're at no, don't actually have the uh, entire protection profile implemented, but uh, uh, we designed it so that we could when we actually release one. And obviously with an open source tool, we don't have $5 million to formally go through the process, but if anyone here wants to sponsor that, we would love it. Cool. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so what does it do? Right. Um, people have been calling it a port scanner. And we're hopeful that after today, they'll see that it's more than that. Uh, but currently, it can do TCP and UDP port scanning. It can do uh, stateless banner grabbing or active remote OS application, blah, blah, blah. It can do stuff. 
And uh, some more of the some more interesting things is that instead of just sending um, a, a non-protocol specific probe, we actually can send uh, the same thing that a normal client would do. So let's say that you're you're trying to find DNS servers. Instead of just sending a blank datagram to, to UDP port 53, uh, we we support a, a number of different payloads out, out of the out of the default config file. One of them uh, can can ask it for localhost. One of them can do a, a chaos. Uh, uh, you know, trying if you're talking about buying server, you're trying to find out what version it is. Uh, but now we're doing uh, just-in-time processing to where you can stuff things uh, in there that you need to calculate on the fly. So, uh, for like Dan Bernstein's DNS server, uh, we we put one in there that will ask it for the IP address that you're talking to. So it can, it can stuff the IP that it's talking to in there on the fly. But any any other thing that you need to calculate right before creating the packet that that also works. Um, and then for TCP, that's it's going to become more important nowadays as well because a lot of the networks that we're testing uh, have those things that uh, that complete the three-way handshake on behalf of the devices that are behind it, and so you're going to find situations where every single port on every single IP on the remote network come back as open, and uh, you need to be able to send protocol-specific payloads so you can figure out which ones are tricking you. Um, then one of the other things that we put in there uh, is a metamorphic shellcode encoder to make it so that uh, when you are delivering um, other types of payloads, that you can make it so that they are not easily uh, fingerprintable. Uh, so not only is is the the NOP sled uh, metamorphic, but the encoder itself is as well. Uh, and so basically, there's 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 nothing to write a signature for at, at this point. Um, we'll see. Okay, and then we, we also can log to, to PCAP files and everything we do, and I, I, I can't stress this enough, everything we're, we're doing from this point forward uh, has, uh, has hooks to, to talk to relational databases on the, on the back end because you cannot process this amount of data without one. Okay, so now I'm going to pass the mic over to Jack. All right, how are we doing, everyone? Are we uh, falling asleep yet? All right, I guess not. Okay, well, there's three processes. I guess uh, uh, it's pretty obvious what they do. I'm not really going to talk about them. Hopefully, we've got to actually leave some time for some demos that we want to do. Okay, um, one of the things that's different is that uh, we try and use, it's kind of a trivial algorithm um, to actually carry information inside the sequence number, but the important part is that it's not one way. So in other words, if we used MD5 and then lopped off part of it, that would be one way. So we can't do that because we actually need to do TCP connections. The problem is, is that we can't actually have the guy who's sniffing and validating the sequence number send back a, qu a question to the master thread um, to figure out if that's correct or not. So uh, we actually have to do that uh, with a trivial algorithm. Anyway, um, and then the scatter connect is, is we basically send out the send packets um, and then we gather on the synapse that we get back and act the connection and actually do whatever it is that uh, the scanners configured to do. Um, well, this is actually kind of long and drawn out. What do I have, like 20 minutes left? Half hour? Okay. Well, I'll go through this. It's actually uh, uh, <laughs> 30 steps to a sim uh, sim symbol uh, send scan. So. Um, basically, uh, obviously, the user would invoke the scanner from the command line. Uh, it actually reads the configuration file first, um, and then the actual uh, uh, command line arguments are parsed at that point um, so that you can override the configuration file. But if you get sick of typing uh, the certain options over and over, you just put them in there. Um, anyways, uh, the, the master process actually opens up binary modules um, through whatever facilities on the system. We actually use... Uh, the uh, LTDL interface now, so it's a bit more portable. And we actually have AutoConf too, which is pretty ugly. Um, anyways, uh, the master process figures out whether or not you want it to run uh, in a clustered mode, which is a command line argument, uh, anyways. Um, but this is actually for a local scan, so we're just assuming um, that it, the master thread is actually going to fork children. Um, and then it actually uh, it records some information about them. Um, and it actually uses the IPC goes through a Unix domain socket, so it's actually a little bit faster than it used to be. Um, and then it actually uses signals to synchronize, which I believe is actually causing us problems <laughs> portability-wise. So uh, uh, one of the problems with this release is that on certain machines the signals disappear, um, and if we actually use reliable signals, it's not portable. So uh, we might actually have to change that a bit anyways. 
Um, and then actually the important part is, is that we can't make the assumption we know what the other processes do um, because we don't know if we're in cluster mode. If we're in cluster mode, all we know is an IP address and a port, um, and we don't know if it's going to send or, or listen. Um, so we actually... Uh, we That's actually, an important piece right there. You don't have to have 16 machines to port scan one machine. You can do it all from one machine. Yeah. It's just you can't scale if you need to. Right. Okay. Um, anyways, that they connect up and uh, and send some information. It's actually the listener that that contains a lot of useful information early on, because it's the guy who has the IP address that matters. Um, so actually, during that handshake, it sends the information back. Um, anyways, uh, and then everyone syncs up with a ready message, um, and then the master actually does something called stirring, um, which actually would be doing the uh, work unit allocation. Um, and we actually have some stuff to do that, but it's kind of specific to us. I think in the uh, general code, we actually don't have anything useful um, when it stirs. But if you actually had a big cluster and you wanted to actually distribute uh, the SIN, SIN packets amongst like geographical areas, that's where you would put the code to do that so that you would actually have the shortest uh, amount of hops between each sender. Okay, uh, anyways, um, right. Uh, then the, the listener fires up, and then we send the sender a batch work unit, which basically means it's not going to get interrupted. Um, so hopefully, uh, or if it's a back, batch sender anyways, um, we don't want to interrupt him. We don't want him to have to, have, have, have to pull the uh, IPC channel because it slows him down. Uh, okay, and then the master just goes into a loop. Um, and uh, the, when the sender finishes, it sends a work done, and then we actually... Uh, uh, check to see if it has more work, um, and it, if not, it just goes into a timeout state. But all, all meanwhile, any any important things that are happening, um, such as TCP connections, um, it'll actually respond to those while it's in its timeout state, um, or actually throughout the entire scan. Uh, and then, actually, the master tells the sender and listener to quit, and then the scan's done. Um, right. Okay. So the important part about all that nonsense is that. Uh, a general stack that's inside of a kernel um, normally knows the remote target that it's going to talk to a remote host and port, but we don't. So we actually don't have that model. It's completely incompatible. Um, so we actually just kind of redid some of the decisions um, inside uh, the stack so that it would better fit a model where we don't know that information, uh, which is the scatter stuff. Anyways, um, right. Okay, uh, one of the important things is, is a lot of stacks will use like a hash table, but we can't actually do that because we don't actually know who's going to talk to us. A good example um, is if we scan a network that actually uh, synacts packets, um, it'll fill up our state table, and if there's nothing behind that device, um, we'll have a bunch of dead entries in our, our connection table, um, and we'll probably guess the size of the hash table wrong by doing that, um, and our hash table will basically either collide to death or it'll have a bunch of linked lists instead of being a hash table. So that's obviously not what we want. Um, we actually have to pick a data structure that responds better um, to unpredictable things like that, like a binary tree. Um, anyways, uh, so right. The, the point is, is that we can only have uh, constant time lookups if we actually have a good guess of how many things we're going to talk to, which we don't. Um, so obviously we can't do that. Um, and even though generally we won't uh, fill the table, we don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, so that's right. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the, if, even if we did have a hash table that was big enough, and this is just obviously for IP version 4, um, it would be quite a bit of RAM, actually, uh, just to store the, uh, uh, the connection entries, not even the data. So that's obviously not very realistic. Um, <laughs> it's just for the keys, anyway. Um, yeah, and right, like I said, the, the reason why that's important is because as time goes on, we see more and more devices to compensate for like high latency networks that will answer part of the three-way handshake to kind of offload that and uh, keep the connection open for the high latency device or improve the performance um, or DDoS protection um, or some obfuscated thing that people do to try and uh, improve security, which I'm sure that works real well. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one of the design goals is we need to be able to withstand this sort of uh, network because we're testing them. Um, anyway, okay, yeah, and 
Right. I already said this. We use a, a red black tree. Um, one of the possible improvements that we're thinking of doing is actually uh, most of the time that's probably an un unnecessary uh, data structure. We could probably use a, a, just a hash table and uh, have constant time. Um, so actually what we want to do is actually switch on the fly. Uh, if we actually pass a threshold uh, and our, our, uh, our table load goes too high, we can actually dump it and turn it into a binary tree on the fly and put a uh, uh, most uh, frequently used cache in front of that. I think it says it in here anyway. Uh, not most recently used, by the way, uh, because that would be a lot of connections closing. Um, we actually need the top talkers, so you actually uh, want it frequent, not recent. Okay, um, anyway, uh, here's some numbers about why we chose the, uh, the algorithms that we did. Um, and the point was is we're just trying to prove that our, our measurements are somewhat valid, um, but we actually inline some assembly in here. You can see it here where we actually read the timestamp counter on a, a Pentium CPU. Um, and then we're actually going to overload our table and see what the performance numbers look like. Uh, and these numbers actually indicate uh, clock ticks. Um, and you can see here with the various load factors um, that uh, our chained hash table um, turns quickly into a bunch of linked lists. Uh, and our uh, red-black tree uh, does not, which should not be much of a surprise anyways. Um, but what's interesting about this actually is the, uh, the amount of load that it took for uh, the CPU to actually uh, get a really expensive lookup, um, which is mainly due to the, I suppose, large cache on the CPU. I'm not really sure. Um, but we fi I figured at least that uh, after a load, at, uh, load of maybe four that it would start dropping off. Um, but it actually took <laughs> somewhere around 30 for the performance to just go uh, really badly. Uh, so, right, I just, actually I talked about that before, whoops. Um, right, but yeah, reset acts, obviously we don't want to cache, and those are always going to be uh, the most recent. So if we're going to do anything to improve the performance, we can't do that. We actually uh, have to calculate how often uh, certain connections are being used and cache those instead. Um, right. Okay, so here's some examples from the payload configuration stuff. Uh, it's just ASCII text. Um, but we tried to make it so that you could copy and paste stuff from like C and put it into the configuration file. Um, but anyway, here's some example stuff. Uh, it, it, obviously UDP is a UDP payload. Uh, if you don't get that, then I guess this is not going to make any sense. Um, and then the, the destination port is actually ne next. And then the source port being negative one is just a wild card to say whatever. Um, and then one is interesting. That's a payload group. One of the things that you can do is you can chain include files together or configuration files together. Um, so you can actually have a bunch of different things that are meant for different sorts of environments. Um, like, if, for example, if you want to scan for like Windows Trojans, um, which are pretty popular, you probably want to put them in their own payload group. Um, and then you can just use the minus big G and then the numeric option for that payload group um, to kind of make that a little bit easier to do. Um, and actually, we have now uh, TCP payloads, which we didn't have before. Um, and it's not still a real socket. It's kind of a trigger response mechanism, but we try and do some TCP stuff. But it turns out it's real hard because we actually emulate the uh, operating system we're appearing to come from. So our stack code is non-trivial, unfortunately. Uh, so, but for right now, you can definitely do this sort of thing and test for, for example, open relays. Um, anyway, and here's some screenshots. Can you guys even see what that says? No. no. I'm going to explain it. Uh, this, is <laughs> this is a module written in C that's actually a HTTP um, module, and it just does a head request. Uh, and it's probably like, I don't know, what is it, 47 lines, apparently? Um, but the, uh, the, that's what it looks like. Okay, this is actually running. Um, a, uh, I don't know, was this, yeah, this was actually a cluster that was uh, connect scanning against yahoo.com on port 80. Um, yeah, and you can see uh, that at the end here it's got some TCP statistics which are interesting, but uh, for each host you can actually see a banner. Now that's probably not terribly exciting. Um, here's probably some better contrast for you um, so you can understand why we did some of the things that we did. Um, this is actually a screenshot of Nmap scanning a website. Um, and it actually comes back and just says that those things are open. Um, but we, and it took eight seconds or something too. Um, but 
we can actually uh, do the same thing and finish it in four seconds. <laughs> well, I guess this is, really isn't a race, but the idea is, is if you see here, you can see like uh, five open ports coming back, which is identical to what we saw before. Um, but during the actual SYN scan, we actually did the connection and grabbed the banner um, without actually initiate, initiating another connection. Um, and we actually uh, can tell what port really is open um, at high rates. Um, okay, uh, here we go. We actually I can do these live, actually. We have internet. Okay. Do you, would you rather see live demos? Because these things are kind of hard to read. Yeah, okay. Let's do, let's do some live stuff. Hang on. Connection isn't dead. All right, cool. So what, what you see here at this first screen, uh, looking at Casio three, that's uh, that's our master thread. Uh, four is our what, what is that? That is the uh, that's the listener. It's listening on the IP address that that we're going to be sending from. This one's number five. This is actually the sender. So just so you can see what that is, and I'm just making sure that they're alive and well. And they appear to be. So, uh, the first demo here. Let me uh, let me look inside this file real quick. Well, um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. We'll, we'll try, but no, all bets are off. If everything breaks, it's your fault. I assume that's better. Yes. You have to forgive me. Um, we're pretty hard on our laptops, and some of our keys are missing. <laughs> okay, so this first one, I just wanted to show you inside it, so you knew I wasn't really cheating. It's just a stupid shell script that runs my command for me. Uh, minus E PG SQL DB just says for the output module, go ahead and dump everything to a database. I'm specifying the source IP to come from, although in cluster mode you don't really need to do that. Minus V means a little bit more verbose. W6 means emulate the, the, the Linux TCP IP stack properties, mostly because that's the one that we, we've spent the most time with to make sure that the connect mode stuff is uh, reliable. Uh, the minus Z is where we specify our drones. Uh, right now, uh, the IPC channel is not protected. Normally, if you're in a sensitive environment or an environment that has any type of malice, you would want to protect that over uh, uh, an encrypted channel of some sort. I, uh, I, I would have to recommend IPsec for that. Right. I've actually tested that. It works pretty well. Minus big L5 is how long to wait after, after the batch sending is done. Minus little r9000 means we're going to send a, it, it, uh, a, around 9,000 packets per second. We actually go a little bit lower than whatever you specify, uh, but it won't exceed 9,000 packets per second. The 66.0.0.0 slash .0 .0 16 uh, just means go to that uh, CIDR block and do uh, 161 for the port, the desk port. Minus MU is UDP mode, and then minus big I is uh, for impatient people like me, so you can see the data right away. So, uh, right. Which, of course, you don't actually want to use minus big I when you're doing a scan that matters because it's going to block on the master thread to write to the terminal, which is fairly silly. And it's not doing what I want, so I'm confused. Cool. Woohoo! Yeah, it's the font, man. <laughs> There you go. Okay. So now these are some SNMP uh, public community string version 1 machines that are responding. As you see, we're doing a slash 16 network. And uh, we're done sending. And we're just waiting the five second timeout. And then it's, it's going to process uh, the results. And it'll spit it back here pretty soon. 
It's actually, we're actually, I think, repeating the scan three times. Um, so if uh, you're wondering why it's just sitting there now, it's actually sending different SNMP payloads to try and get everyone. <laughs> XOR. <laughs> it's pretty ugly, actually. Um, we're actually trying to figure out a better algorithm that'll favor uh, randomizing the more significant bits first. Um, but I actually haven't had time to get around to that, so it just kind of XORs a random word. So that was a slash 16 for, for, uh, for SNMP with multiple payloads. But those are absolutely open because we sent uh, a public community string request and it sent us back responses. Uh, the TTL is wrapping over thanks to our insane font size. But if it wasn't, you would be able to see uh, the, the, the time to live value of the packet that's coming back to you. And so you can quickly, as you're looking through it, you can spot uh, you know, Windows Novell stacks versus uh, Unix stacks versus uh, infra routing infrastructure. But all of that uh, went back to a database that we may be able to show you. But we'll, I don't want to run out of time because we have some really cool fireworks at the end. So. Oh, okay. So more demo two. This one is SMTP. This one's actually going to look for uh, open relay servers in the same block. And now we're actually doing three-way handshakes with all those guys. So this is TCP port 25. We are absolutely connecting to them on port 25 and sending uh, enough of a payload to elicit um, uh, well, basically what I did is I, I, I said coming from uh, an email address, address that I control, send me to another email address that I control, and that way I, I can get b bounces back uh, telling me that I was a bad person, or I can actually get the email that I sent. But then uh, either way, I still get the banner of all the systems that we just talked to. Um, so if nothing else, I, I, know I, have, I now have version information in my database that I can search through and say, show me all the send mailboxes. One thing that's important, too, is that he had the immediate mode on, uh, but he was doing TCP connections, so all the immediate things that needed to happen right away got stalled. Um, so some of the TCP connections will actually kind of fail. It makes for a better demo, array. but you wouldn't do that in production, obviously. Okay, so this next one is an HTTP GET request. Again, we're going to connect to TCP port 80 and, uh, and just hit all the people that are listening on port 80, and we'll, we'll do a, a GET request against them. Yeah. Okay, so that was a pretty simple get request here. That was a really small range. Of, let's look at that. That's just a slash 30. That's Yahoo with a slash 30. So, piece of cake, right? Okay, um, let's see what else we had here. Oh, I, I wanted to show you what was in the slide. Sorry. Uh, this is this is Nmap uh, with port 78 through 82 against uh, dietsecurity.com. The all ports come back open, uh, which is what we expect because we have a stupid device in the in the middle that protects us from uh, DDoS. Um, but here's uh, with the unicorn scan, where we can actually enumerate what the protocol behind the three-way handshake looks like. So you see here. Uh, that even though the other ones came back as open, uh, in your database you can do a, a pretty simple uh, select statement to throw away the garbage properties. And, and sometimes you'll, you'll even get better, uh, uh, better information about the stack properties itself because once, uh, once you get sent to the, the, the right application behind it, there's going to be telltale signs that, that you're talking to a different device than the one that actually completed the three-way handshake for you. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty easy at this point to where you can actually, it's kind of like the UDP situation all over again. Um, you know, in, in the UDP, again, now we're sending real uh, protocol payloads as opposed to just counting on, on ICMP messages. Uh, but now in TCP land, uh, we're actually sending real protocol information so we can get away from these devices that just uh, synac everything. Now, uh, I think this is, yeah. This is just showing that we can do multiple uh, payloads all on, on one. So this one's sending like uh, 50 or so different different payloads. We've got some uh, DNS servers. We got some SNMP servers. Port 2367. Don't know what that is. 13, 7. Yeah, all these are coming back to us now. And uh, I guess this is just showing off, you know, what uh, what it looks like to do multiple payloads. So that was the easy stuff. 
Um, now comes the tricky part. So hang on. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what we're going to do now, and hopefully it won't break, because <laughs> I was still writing code for it last night. <laughs> anyway, um, what we do is we do basically a TCP Connect scan um, in, on port 80, and there's actually a CGI script that has a really dumb coding error in it. Um, we actually had some other stuff that we are going to do, but the uh, political climate kind of got ugly. So Yeah, we were going to release some fun stuff, but unfortunately nobody wants to hear that sort of thing these days. So we actually... Uh, just reuse some other stuff we had. Um, but basically it does a three-way handshake um, and it, it actually uh, generates the XOR encoder on the fly, which is metamorphic. Um, and it actually does a two-stage exploit. Uh, one of the problems that I had, though, <laughs> was that I didn't have enough time to write the uh, two-stage NetBSD uh, assembly, so I cheated and used uh, some other someone else's stuff, and it doesn't work, so that just goes to show me... <laughs> Okay, so, right, we generate a metamorphic first stage and we send the payload. Um, what we're supposed to want to do here is uh, Apache hands all the CGI scripts, a writable file descriptor on, on two, um, that's the error log. So the first thing that we do in our shellcode is we truncate that. Um, we create a socket and connect back um, to a uh, second stage server, and we send it some information about the platform that we've just, or the process that we've just compromised. Um, and we actually just send back a 32-bit uh, word um, saying what, what predefined constant that was. So, um, and then the shellcode server sends back um, the length of the payload that we're going to send in the second stage, and it does memmap and opens up uh, an anonymous memory region um, at a fixed address, um, and it loads a hacked binary into that area um, and jumps uh, to the beginning of the file which then, uh, and I mentioned that the ELF is hacked because we actually overwrote the first part of the ELF header with some assembly to jump to the entry point. <laughs> so, um, but the, the important point is that the second stage is written in C. It's similar to the uh, impurity stuff, actually. Um, anyway, uh, and then we transfer control to the second stage code by jumping to the ELF or entry point. Yeah, oh, right, so this is the part where I do it and it doesn't break. Okay, this is the NetBSD box. Okay, as you can see, uh, this shellcode doesn't work, um, so the only thing we can do is just look at port 4444. Um, this is the second stage server. Uh, and then we actually have two of these clients. One of them actually uses end curses, so it opens up new windows every time you get a shell. It's kind of neat. Um, but we're having some terminal issues, uh, and we can't figure out end curses. It's kind of above us, so we don't have that yet. going to show you is the TCP dump so you can see that it, it really is working. And we're being told to hurry up, so you've got like five seconds. Okay, so here it goes. Hopefully it won't crash, huh? Okay, so we first have to grab an IP address um, that's not attached to the kernel. As you can see, some stuff went by here. So connected uh, to port 80, it sent our uh, our payload. Right. And now and we have a shell. Yeah, so you can see here that uh, the second stage shellcode server got it connected back. It sent back the word that said it was... This particular one was Linux x86. The, the important part about that demo, though, is that after it got the, uh, it, it connected to two different hosts, and after it got the Synac back, it did operating system detection, and it sent a, a platform-specific exploit to it on the fly. It knew, it knew how to generate a platform-specific exploit on the fly. So that was actually pretty cool. Unfortunately, we don't have time to explain in more detail, but if you're interested, come find us. Yeah. And you can actually watch DVDs in ASCII, which was the entire point of doing that. 